us, and that's Christian Fourier. Christian, it's Zach Gelb and Chase Sr. How are you? I'm good, guys. How are you doing this uh, trip to fan free morning? Well, we are doing great, and uh, it's a nice day here in Philadelphia. And uh, let's go over that Auburn-Alabama game. It was one of the greatest football games I ever saw. It was a classic. You had the A.J. McCarron 99-yard touchdown pass. Then Alabama uh, loses their lead to Auburn. It, they tie up the game, and then you eventually had that late uh, one-second play. Alabama kicks the field goal. It's no good, and Auburn returns it to the house. That was one of the greatest endings in the history of a sports game that I've ever seen. Yeah, you know what? Back in 1994, we had a Hail Mary pass when I was playing with Colorado against uh, uh, Michigan. But as far as a game that really kind of gave you everything you wanted, even even before that kick, you know, saving, getting some, getting one second on the clock. I mean, you know, trying to see if TJ Yeldon's foot had gone down before the the clock struck zero. That was like one of those things where I mean, are we really splitting hairs right now to try and figure out if there's a millisecond left on the clock? Well, you know, fortunate for Auburn that there was time left on the clock because he was able to kick the ball. It was short, and they returned it for a touchdown. And when I was watching this game in the studio on Saturday, everybody was yelping and screaming and running around like crazy. It was amazing because everybody was trying to think of, uh, you know, the, the theory, the thought process, and what could happen, what could go wrong. You know, the last we thought was, okay, maybe it's a block, maybe he tries to drive it so he has to hit it low and Auburn gets a chance to score. Either way, it, it always ended up being in Auburn's favor, and most of these things usually never happen, but you prepare for them. But I've actually never seen one happen, uh, and uh, I guess uh, Devin Hester had one for the Chicago Bears. Other than that, I've never seen it before. I also remember Antonio Cromartie having like a 108-yard kickoff return uh, when he was playing with the San Diego Chargers. But uh, this job that Gus Malzahn has done, they were 3-9 and nine a year ago. Where they fired their coach in Chiswick, and uh, they went over to Gus Malzahn, and uh, he's really turned this program around. They're number three in the nation now, and they're getting ready to hopefully play for that championship game. Uh, they're going to be in the SEC championship game. What do you think has been the difference between a year ago to now with this Auburn team? Because it's been a big turnaround. Well, I think, first of all, Gus Maldon recruited a bunch of those players. So all those players, most of them offensively, were guys that were picked, handpicked to run his offensive system. Now, when uh, Gene Chizik left, uh, before that, he hired uh, Scott Leckler, and they went to a more of a pro-style attack. It just didn't work. They only lasted a year. They couldn't win any games. Then your Gus Maldon, and he just goes back and puts his system back in there. And lucky for him that he gets Nick Marshall, who turns out to be a, a, a great quarterback. Uh, he's not Cam Newton, but he doesn't have to be. And the defense that was so young started to make plays. And let's, quite frankly, let's just be honest, they got really lucky a couple times. I mean, unbelievably lucky. You go to that back to that Georgia game, and the, uh, it was a Lewis who basically gives up on the route. Nick Marshall overthrows them, the two Georgia guys. One tries to grab it, the other tries to tip it away. It bounces up, and Lewis, lo and behold, hey, look what I found. I'm going to score a touchdown and win this game. So... I think in any championship caliber team, uh, in any season like this, you have to have a little bit of luck on your side. Uh, I've never seen any team just blow out every single every, every single team they play without you know, being fortunate on one side of the ball. But, I mean, the, the thing that's funny about this is, like, Auburn's getting all this attention for playing the BCS championship, and they still got to play Missouri. And Missouri only has one loss also because their kicker couldn't make a chip shot in overtime against South Carolina. So... This is, this is dangerous territory. I think people are walking around with this Auburn already kind of anointing them and trying to see if they can play in the national championship game where Ohio State hasn't lost. Florida State is going to kill Duke. And Missouri could very well beat Auburn in the SEC championship, but then they're going to say, oh, what about Missouri? So weird situations going on right now. Christian Fourier, CBS Sports Network, joins Chase Sr. and Zach Galb on the main event, WHIP, Philly's number one college radio station. Christian, it's Chase. I just want to take you back to the last couple of minutes of that ball game, Alabama and Auburn. If you're Nick Saban, you have A.J. McCarron, who's a Heisman candidate. He's been one of the best quarterbacks in college football history. And, you know, are you sending out Cade Foster at the end of the game to kick that long field goal? It was from 50-plus yards, uh, n no time, basically no time left on the clock. And, you know, he, he was struggling going into that kick. If you're Nick Saban, are you sending him out there for that kick or are you throwing a Hail Mary? No. I think it's at that point, uh, Cade Foster had missed two kicks. He had another one blocked, which isn't necessarily his fault. And by the fourth one, 
they brought in a young kid who I think he'd only kicked like twice or something like that in the whole year. But he was had more he had more range to his leg. He, he had kicked sixty yards in practice, at least that was the word coming out. But I, you know, you just assume that he, if he might just miss it, maybe he'll drive it through the end zone. You know, it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you know we can we can retrospect, look back, and hindsight twenty twenty, and he should have done this, he should have thought of this. The fact is that you know you, you know he made the best decision because he didn't want to go into overtime. Neither defense could stop the other offense. And just like Ohio State, Michigan, and Brady Hope goes for it on two instead of going into overtime and letting them duke it out offensively, I think it was the right call. It's just they had the wrong people on there to cover. You got enough those fat guys and uh, long snappers and kickers. None of those guys want contact. You know they can't cover. They can't tackle in space. A.J. McCarron has had a historic career with the Crimson Tide. He's won two national championships. Uh, this year he's thrown two 26 touchdowns to just five interceptions. He's very good with growing, going through his progressions and kind of analyzing the defense pre-snap. Uh, he, he's more of a drop-back quarterback, and I know a lot of people uh, love quarterbacks with mobility, but where do you see him projecting at the next level? Well, I mean, I think what you got to like about him is his ability to get you in the right play. Like, what A.J. McCann usually won't do is he's not going to lose the game for you. Um, he'll put you in the right position make sure everybody's lined up, and he'll take care of the football. Uh, I think he played Mississippi State a couple weeks ago, and he had two careless throws that led interceptions. They still won the game, but it was uncharacteristic of what he does week in and week out. Um, so, is he a top draft choice? No. But I think whoever gets him is going to have a legitimate – uh, contender for an eventual starting position uh, at some point. You know, like we're talking about here in Massachusetts that the Patriots would be fools or they didn't snatch him up. If there's a guy that you know, you know, is it going to be? It's going to be Tom Brady. Probably not. But Tom Brady was picked in the sixth round, and nobody, everybody looked past him. And, and I think what you do in college football, if you can protect the football, if you're smart, if you're diligent, if you're a hard worker. That's basically what it takes to make it in the NFL. I mean, the talent is a given. You can't make it to the NFL unless you don't have the talent. Putting the work in and the extra work in, I think, kind of sets the, the, the good players from the great players. Christian Farrier joins us a few more questions with him, CBS Sports College Football Analyst. And Christian, uh, let's say if Ohio State and uh, Florida State both beat Michigan State and Duke respectively, do you think the winner of that Auburn-Missouri game has a legitimate argument to the national championship, or is it just if Ohio State and FSU wins, that's going to be your championship game? No, I don't think they do. Uh, I've seen them all play, and the you know, losses have to count for something. Um, I, mean, I know Ohio State hasn't played – the best competition in the Big Ten, uh, but they've won all their games. Uh, remember, uh, uh, Auburn barely beat Washington State. Uh, Auburn lost to uh, uh, to LSU. Um, so, I mean, we're splitting hands here. So, uh, I don't care what happens with the Auburn Mrs. Missouri game. If Ohio State beats Michigan State, which is probably their biggest test of the year with that defense that they have, uh, they're anemic on offense. So. Uh, but if they beat Michigan State, they will be playing for the national championship against Florida State. And then I don't know if that will be a bad game because Ohio State can score a lot of points. I mean, they're averaging 48 points per game. They have one of the best runners in the nation. And this guy, if she has a missed three games, he's a Heisman Trophy candidate. Braxton Miller misses a couple games. Uh, Teddy Guyton goes in. If she doesn't miss those games, he's a Heisman Trophy candidate. They have two Heisman Trophy candidates, in my opinion, on their offense. So... It's not like they can't compete and go score for score. The question is, can their defense, who's just been playing like a sieve lately, can they slow down anybody? And that answer is going to be no. So, who can score the most points? If Ohio State's able to beat Michigan State on Saturday, that's going two straight seasons without losing a single game. Uh, how much credit do you give Urban Meyer for the success he's brought the Buckeyes? Because before he came, uh, they were struggling a little bit. No, well, I mean, I give them all the credit. I mean, but that's real in that situation. You know, Luke, Luke Fickle comes in, and he's an interim head coach. And, I mean, he's really a lame duck coach because he knows he's not going to be a guy. Yeah. Uh, right. he, did, he did the best he could. And they ended up losing to Michigan. Uh, it was still a good game. But here comes Urban Meyer, the big sexy pick, you know, Florida coach, always always had a, a track record of, you know, uh, improving the team uh, from the year before. And he goes undefeated. Now, I get it. The Big Ten is not – a very not the SEC. I wouldn't call it the, the, the Pac-12, but they still have NFL players on their roster. 
They still compete at a high level. Uh, and going undefeated two years in a row, one year in a row, is really unheard of. Uh, two years in a row, I mean, it, I know it's not a, a career achievement, two-year uh, record deal for the national championship, but I think there's a human element to this. When voters look at that, they go, wait a second. They kind of got... They're, they kind of got screwed last year. Now let's make up for it this year and not allow a one-loss team to jump up for the national championship game. Do you still talk to Mike Vrabel? I know he's on that staff at Ohio State since you won two Super Bowls with the Pats in 03 and 04. No, I haven't talked to Mike since I left. You know, he's been doing this thing. Went to Kansas City. I went to uh, Washington. Then I also went to Carolina. Then I retired. He retired. Both kind of went a separate ways. But, uh, listen, if, uh, if he needs any advice, you know, I'm easy to get in contact with. <laughs> All right, let's get to this uh, Michigan-Ohio State ending. It was a fascinating game. I was actually watching the game. A buddy of mine goes to Michigan, and the other buddy goes to Ohio State, so that was fun to see the way that game ended out. Do you like the decision to go for two? Because I thought it was a good call there in that spot. No, I thought it was a great call. Uh, like I said earlier, neither team could stop the other's offense. And, uh, you know, Al Borges from Michigan had, did, has, had been doing a great job of calling that game offensively. They did a great job of getting everybody in space and, uh, and getting guys open field running. Uh, I don't like the call that they made. I don't like the play that they called. Agreed. But I like the idea to go for two. I just, you know, you got Devin Gardner who finally had one of his best games and he was moving around well. To kind of sit him in the pocket and just kind of have him throw, I just didn't like it. I would have moved him to the right. I would have moved him to the left. So if there isn't a play there, if, if he isn't open, he can run it in. So, uh, but again, I like the call. I don't think it was a gutsy call. I think it was the right call to make. Christian Farrier from CBS joins us. A few more questions with him before we let him run. Uh, let's get to the Heisman. I'm going to be covering that um, coming up in a few weeks. Uh, who, who would you name the favorite right now for the Heisman if you had a vote? You know, I don't really – the Heisman is, is kind of weird this year. There hasn't been anybody, I guess, that's really stood out to me. Yes, James Winston has the numbers. But, you know, last year we had Johnny Mandel. Uh, the year before that we had Rob Griffith III. Uh, each guy was kind of transcending in his position and, and, and then a, like a once-in-a-lifetime type of guy to come along. So they did some really special teams and Baylor beating Texas and Oklahoma and Johnny Mandel beating Alabama at the end of the year in Alabama. So there was a lot of, I think there was a lot of shine on those guys for what they were capable of doing and the way they played the game. This year, uh, maybe we're just spoiled, but uh, they're just, I, I don't think anyone's running away from it. You know, you can, you can give it to A.J. McCarron, like in sort of like a, in case of emergency, break glass, like give it to A.J. McCarron. Uh, he's just been so steady. Um, but uh, you know, his numbers are good. Uh, his team always win. But Jameis Winston is a guy, but in the end, and you got Andre Williams up in Boston College. You got Kadeem Carey in Arizona. Johnny Mandel's probably still the best player in college football. He just threw too many picks, and he didn't win enough games. And that was it. If he beats Missouri, he's probably back in it. You know, in the mix. If he, if he plays good against LSU, he's probably still in the mix. But he had his worst game of his career against LSU. And he just played okay against Missouri. So it's probably going to go to Winston. Uh, but at the same point, it could really go to anybody. I'd be fine with it. Could you see some voters, because the Heisman is a very big integrity award and uh, the voters take a lot of pride in giving it out, could you see some of the off-the-field problems from Winston maybe making a few voters not vote for him? Sure, I think I, 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 definitely. I think some guys just are looking at that or, or maybe they're rushing to judgment and they don't want to be they don't be held accountable for voting for a guy that gets charged for rape. Uh, um, so maybe, but my thing is like, if, if, the, if you have to vote today and you're not charged, then you need to vote with who you think is the best player in college football, regardless of what you think may or may not happen in the future. Just vote for the guy who earns it. If he gets charged, well, what are you going to do? Like, they can take the highest trophy away from you. They could just ask Reggie Bush. I mean, so, and what he did wasn't nearly as bad as what Winston is accused of doing. Okay, that's for sure. He's accused of that. He hasn't been proven guilty of anything, you know. So, we'll see. Christian, your nephew, Joseph, is uh, having a good year with the Detroit Lions, 11 receptions, six touchdowns so far. That offense has been prolific at times with Matt Stafford and Calvin Johnson. Reggie Bush also having a pretty good year. Uh, they come here to Philadelphia on Sunday. Both teams are 7-5. and five. Both teams are hot. Uh, how do you see things playing out? Because uh, the Eagles have won four straight games. Their defense is playing well. And Nick Foles uh, has been the story here with 19 touchdowns and zero interceptions. Yeah, Nick Foles has done a great job. 
And I tell you what, you kind of knew that that offense that Chip Kelly was putting in was going to take a while to kind of, you know, you know, figure itself out. You know, uh, Michael Vick starts and he gets hurt and he throws three picks and they speed it up and they don't speed it up. The issue I have with Detroit is they might have the most talent I've seen on uh, on any team, offensively and defensively. The biggest issue is they just they're just dumb. They just they can't get out of their own way. They make stupid mistakes. Uh, uh, you know, they throw kicks. So, I mean, Stafford sometimes you wonder like who's he throwing to. Uh, and they put themselves in very difficult situations. Now, if Detroit can somehow rally and uh, get together and decide that we are not going to have personal foul issues, we're not going to have a bunch of dumb penalties, uh, they're going to take care of the football, they will destroy Philadelphia. They'll, they'll beat Philadelphia because I don't think they can match up with them. Uh, but, uh, you know, Detroit, just like it did uh, Thanksgiving Day against uh, Green Bay, allows teams to hang around. There's no way Green Bay should have hung around with them as long as they did. They eventually blew them out. But they shouldn't have been able to hang around with them. They were just too good. They just couldn't miss the field goal, the interception here, driving down, kind of finish that drive, have to settle for three points. So, I mean, this is turning out to be one of the better games of the week. Um, again, a great one to watch. Final one here on the way out with Christian Faria. And uh, you saw the Patriot teams that won Super Bowls. They didn't make a lot of mistakes. And I think that's a great point with Detroit. They have a lot of uh, unsportsmanlike conduct penalties. Stafford's starting to throw a lot of interceptions. They have an all-great player in Calvin Johnson at wide receiver, who's just a freak also uh, when you look athletically and the way that he makes some of those catches. But how do you play mistake-free football? Because your Belichick teams uh, with those Patriots didn't throw too many interceptions or didn't fumble the ball or make any dumb penalties in the late months of December and uh, January. January. Well, first of all, you have to care. I mean, you, you have to you have to give a crap. Your give a crap level, you know, that's the lack of a better word that I can't use, has to be high. You have to care about making mistakes. You can't be selfish. Guys who make mistakes or personal foul penalties, or in the end, they're selfish because you get pushed, some of that, you want to push back, uh, and instead of just holding your tongue, swallowing your pride, you push somebody, you get a personal foul, and that's the whole team. Okay, yeah, you got him top. Okay, good for you. Now he's laughing as he walks back to a tunnel. So that's not the mentality you have to have. Uh, you know, and I think good coaches coach good players. Uh, if, you're, if your players are uh, jumping off sides, uh, that means they're not disciplined. If not disciplined, the coach is not coaching you right. Um, it has to mean something to you. Uh, what I always liked is when uh, these coaches would show you how a play would affect the entire game, how that one stupid, selfish act affected the entire game. Maybe it extended the drive, it changed field position. In the end, it was a different picker of the game. And if you're that guy, then you shouldn't be playing because it just hurts everybody. Well, Christian, we appreciate a few minutes today. Thanks so much. Enjoy the college football and the pro football this weekend, and we'll talk to you down the road. All right, thanks. Christian Foria right there, CBS uh, College Football Analyst. 215-204-9449 is the number if you want to hop on board with us. we got to take a quick break here on the main event. Philly's number one college radio station, WHIP. And when we get back, we got to do some Temple football action. They ended the season with a big victory up against Memphis. Matt Rule's now on the road recruiting, and the players are back at the practice facility lifting weights and getting ready for the big 2014-2015 season. Matt Rule will join us tomorrow along with John Baum to talk some Temple football and some Temple basketball. But we'll take a quick break. When we get back, we'll recap the Temple football season.